So this session is entitled Learning from Our Senior Leaders in Immigration and Settlement. And the idea from it really emerged um, from our awareness that there are a number of senior leaders in immigration and settlement who are retiring, have retired, or are perhaps <coughs> nearing retirement. And we realized that we could learn a lot from these people. And we invited several of them to share their experiences and expertise with us today. Um, many of us don't necessarily know the full history um, and know what it was like in the sector when they started, how we got from there to where we are now. And in addition, we um, felt that it would be great to hear some of the lessons that they've learned through their years of experience and also how they envision the future of immigration to Canada. So these are the types of questions we'll be asking today. Uh, just before we get started, I'd like to mention that this session is sponsored by the Pre-Arrival Canada program of the YMCA of Greater Toronto. And we have a very short video um, just to get started. Hi, and welcome to prearrivalcanada.ca. We're a new online service in the Canadian pre-arrival sector, and we'd like for you to get to know us. There are many pre-arrival programs that can help newcomers before they come to Canada. But with many great programs to choose from, newcomers must search for and register individually with each program. Prearrivalcanada.ca aims to remove this barrier with just one easy registration, allowing newcomers to apply for multiple programs at once. So let's take a look at how it works. After receiving approval for pre-arrival services from Immigration, Refugees and Citizenship Canada, Newcomer clients can go online to prearrivalcanada.ca. From there, they can proceed to step one. This step pre-screens clients for eligibility. Passing the pre-screening, they go to step two. Here, the client can explore services in greater detail. Step three is the final step, registration. Clients can choose from employment and settlement programs that they are eligible for. Uploaded with their registration, are any applicable immigration documents. This makes the transition to services quick and seamless. That registration goes to our administration team who will either approve or deny the client based on the program specific requirements set out by our pre-arrival partners. This client is then forwarded to applicable pre-arrival programs with their eligibility already checked. Another way we assist the pre-arrival sector is by making referrals between programs faster. Prearrivalcanada.ca was created so that every newcomer finds pre-arrival services available to them, a program for every pre-arrival newcomer. Prearrivalcanada.ca. We hope to see you soon. Great. So our speakers in this <clears throat> discussion today uh, include Fairbors Berjandian, uh, St. Fard Desir, uh, Jean McCrae, Jerry Miltz, uh, Laurie Sawatsky, and Deb Tunis. And uh, for more details of their very illustrious careers, uh, please take a look at the bio notes that are in the virtual conference uh, platform app. <clears throat> So I'm going <clears> to <throat> I'm going to ask them to start off by responding to a series of questions that we've put together to bring out their experiences and their expertise, and then I will open it up for you to ask some questions via Slido. So we're going to start at the beginning, and I'm going to start with Jerry. Uh, thank you. Uh, well, I was in a small province, Nova Scotia, whose recent history of immigration was, um, you know, a million people through Pier 21, and then 1987, 176 Sikhs arrived on our South Shore, uh, which was a bit of a surprise to people. But um, immigration wasn't on the radar. It had nothing to do with our communities, nothing to do with our province. Uh, that was something that happened elsewhere. And immigrants were pretty invisible if they came. Uh, there wasn't a settlement sector. There was a small um, uh, settlement organization, mostly volunteers, and there was a language school where um, public school teachers had been pulled out of the system uh, to teach language. 
Um, but of course, that was mostly for men. Uh, uh, people de immediately destined for the workforce, which meant that women were, uh, didn't have access to language training. Um, so like uh, most other organizations, if not all on this table, we started in church basement. Um, volunteers, um, we taught English, we drove English, uh, people to apartments, we begged our dent doctors and dentists to see people, we moved people, we taught people to drive, all those things that many of you are doing now. The difference was we weren't paid and nobody looked at what we were doing. Uh, nobody was overseeing what we did. Um, I was new to the country on a temporary foreign work visa um, and so I, back then, I couldn't work and I couldn't go to school. So uh, this was a perfect match for me. Um, and I realized like many immigrants, um, I'd found my community in this, um, in this work. And then in 1988, we received our first funding, 27,000, thank you, CEIC. Um, we, uh, it was for a year um, and uh, it was for a settlement language training program, which included childcare. So even back then, um, childcare was on the, uh, on the radar. We found a space, we bought secondhand furniture, uh, we stripped tables and painted tables. Um, we weren't allowed to buy them um, with money because there was no money for capital costs. So we had to buy them with our own funding, own funding, own money. Um, we, renovation back then, we were talking about it last night, renovation back then meant that we went out and bought cans of paint and we spent the nights um, painting the walls. Um, so on the first time we did this, we painted the walls. We were, it was lovely blue, it really was nice. Uh, but we came back the next morning to find that we painted on top of oil paint. So the paint was on the floor. Um, uh, there were only four of us in the beginning. Um, the first person who arrived had the dubious honor of shoveling all the snow. Um, and it was five or six years before I had an office, uh, which was carved out of the hallway. Uh, didn't think about it, but there was no heating in there. So I spent a couple of years in there with uh, a rather fetching quilt and blankets uh, wrapped around me. Um, we were paid by the hour, no benefits, no travel allowance, no health care, no RSP contributions, uh, minimum wage, yes, thank you, um, and no funding for administration. Uh, we have funding to be able to teach, but we had no funding for administration. We had to learn how to set up an organization, develop bylaws, uh, recruitable. We had no, we had no, we had no background in this. Uh, we had to document expenditure, pay wages, make sure that we were paying and, and deducting the right amounts. Um, all that was in the evenings on our laps um, after a day's work. There were no partners, no sectors, uh, no sector. And um, our focus was on the work in front of us. We weren't actually interested in what other people were doing in our, across the country and in our community because there was work to be done in our face. So we did the work that had to be done. Um, CIC was the only funder at the beginning. Um, the province wasn't involved for another 10, 11, 12 years. Um, and there was no real relationship with CIC. They came every month to look at the books, literally to look at the books. Um, they would have the accounts book and the wages book and check to make sure we were doing what we should be doing. Accountability was only financial. Um, nobody talked about goals or outcomes, uh, what clients were doing, what we were doing, what we needed. And the relationship could be difficult because in those early years, remember this, um, April the 1st was just a date. We never, ever had contracts signed for April the 1st. <laughs> Think about it, which meant we had no, um, we had no history with the banks, which meant that how were we were going to pay the rent? Well, we went to the landlords and said, sorry, it's going to be late for a few months. But we had to pay wages to keep people there. So many of us, some of us, some of us crazy people took out personal loans um, to be able to, uh, with the bank, to be able to pay the wages, hoping that CIC would come through and we would be able to get our money back. Um, it was hard, it was frustrating, uh, but it was an incredibly exciting time. Um, we knew, it was all so new, um, but we knew that we were doing something really important uh, back then. In the community, as I said, we were pretty invisible, but in some way it helped us because what happened was we were, um, we were allowed the time to develop, to plan, to make mistakes and to, uh, to talk to others. 
And then after a couple of years in Nova Scotia, four of these small organizations, uh, three, of this were, three of which were language focused, we came together and we set up an organization. That was tough, honestly, for those of you who have done that, because there was a very, very limited amount of money um, in the pot. CEIC was the only funder, um, and we were trying to talk together about needs, and what we were really wanted was, how much money are you going to get, and how much money am I going to get? Um, so it was a difficult relationship, but we were, uh, we were committed to making that work, because we knew that that was the way forward. And then in the early 1990s, we started to connect across the Atlantic. Uh, we didn't have an association or funding for quite a few years, uh, but we did start to talk to each other. And I have to give a shout out here to some of you will know Bridget Foster uh, from Newfoundland, who uh, back then uh, led the charge for us in the Atlantic to form an association, ARISA, um, to, make, uh, to make sure that we, were, we could talk with other settlement or uh, not um, uh, umbrella associations across the country. Um, so it was, it was cold and it was lonely and it was thrilling and exciting time. <laughs> thank you. And Fairborn, did you want to add to that? Sure, thank you very much. First of all, I, I'm really glad that you have organized this session because uh, if you don't know your past, if you don't know what happened, what is the culture that you have, where it come from, it's very hard to navigate the future. So I'm hoping that what you remember from this conversation is that there is a past, there is a begin, there was a beginning, and now we are at the stage we are, and there will be a future. And I really encourage others, especially the younger generation that are joining the sector, to pay attention to that. It is so, so, so important. I mean, you heard what Jerry was saying, and I'm going to repeat the same thing, but I'm going to look at the different, different aspect of that. I think our agencies, they were really a response of our community to settlement integration. It was not the government wanted to do that. It was our community decided. And really started with the arrival of 60,000 Vietnamese refugees. They were significant numbers for that time, but also it was significant because we were not from Europe. So those are the fundamental that changed the whole approach of communities. In my case, working with the agency that I work for, CCIS, it was a handful of volunteers. They got together, they say we have to do something for these people. That in our community, there's no system. I just give you a little bit of history of mine, and I think it would be the same. They actually went to the government, and they said, you are bringing these people here, so give us some support, so as a volunteer, we can help them. And frankly, they told them that we don't have a support system. We never thought about that they need support. And I think they, it had a reason. It was not that they were vicious. It, was, it had a reason, because historically, immigration were 90% coming from Europe, and they had a whole different approach in settlement. The churches, the small communities, they looked after that. And the immigration also, face of immigration changed as well. And I really want you to go back and see the policy changes in mid, uh, uh, late 70s that resulted in that whole different, of, uh, different view and different vision about immigration, which is, has a whole different, different conversation. So it was a really community response. So they went to the government, and government said, there's no money, I, we don't have money. We never thought about that. We brought 60,000 people, but we never thought they need you know, language classes or this and that. So they went to the Bishop of Calgary, and the Bishop of Calgary, he gave them $20,000 plus a basement church, not this church, a school, St. Mary's School, that was an old, it was actually abandoned. It was not being used. It was kind of, you know, they shouldn't be using that building, actually. But they gave the basement of that, which was a, a, a gymnasium and two rooms as a donation. And then they went back to the government, and the government actually felt a bit bad, and they gave them for the $20,000. So this is how a handful of volunteers started this organization, and I think the story goes across the country. So it's so, so important to understand it was not created to become a contractor. We were there to, with a very clear mission of given by our community to do what we are doing today. Of course, we are more complicated, more sophisticated, more all those things, but at the end of the day, I hope everybody remembers the why we exist. Agencies. No, no, we're not contracted. We are there to feel a mandate that community has given to us. Now, saying that, going back to tell you how, how it was. I joined the sector in 1988, uh, was a refugee myself, a government-sponsored refugee. 
obviously, you know, went to that basement and worked there, shared one desk with another colleague, and we had no phone. There were only four phones in the gymnasium, so we all had to run to pick up the phone. And we had a rented property to uh, resettle, I mean, actually put the uh, refugees. That was a awful place to stay, be honest with you, I stayed there with myself. It was a beautiful, in a sense, of the spirit of it, but it was old building, and we had to actually close it down to uh, kill the cockroaches every six months. Honestly, that was literally what it was. So as Jerry said, we were not on a priority. We were not that important. From the client's point of view, I give you a few examples so you can imagine how different it is. We could, we, uh, the banks did not open bank account for refugees. We simply, they said, not interested, they don't speak language, they don't have money, why would... So this is what we had. Now you see that old banks are coming to you, giving you a little bit of money, trying to uh, help you, uh, help them to open the bank account. I think that should describe the situation. So we had actually to take the issue to, our, to Toronto with the RBC and fight with them and get a directive from RBC head office, because they were kind of felt politically bad, to the branches, open the bank account for them. But we had to give the commitment that every time a person goes there, we send somebody to make sure that the language issue is resolved. We were looking at the minimum wages. There were no benefit. There were basically, there was nothing. But what happened in the past, I would say, 40 years, is a group of volunteers, group of very, very dedicated people that they came to this country as a refugee, as an immigrant, a lot of mainstream uh, staff we had, that they were as dedicated, as determined as we were. And now we have this sector, which I believe, which is the, I mean, I can say that with, no, uh, with authority, that it is the best sector in the world. We don't have anything across the world like what we have here. And one of the reasons Canada immigration is doing well is because of us, because of you because of you and your volunteers. So I hope that we remember that. Again, I didn't want to go and make you cry for us because I think we survived, we are okay now. <laughs> but I also suggested actually we bring a picture of ourselves when we joined the sector. So I didn't look like this before. I mean, you didn't. yeah, I didn't, no. So I just wanted to be careful. Yeah, you did. Yeah, okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Fair Boris. And so the next question is, a bit more about how did we get from there to where we are now, and maybe I'll turn to some of you to answer. Um, thank you. Um, I was thinking about, uh, you know, the description about basically language services being being provided. We had our own acronyms back then, so early program SLTP. I'd love to see a show of hands who knows what that means. But anyway, <laughs> <laughs> Settlement Language Training Program, uh, which, you know, birthed LINK and the Settlement Program. In Victoria, the only, and well, this is true, the only services that were funded were funded for refugees. They weren't funded for the other classes of immigrants, which is an enormous change. And really that change came about because of the work that these you know, less gray-haired people uh, did um, <laughs> in the past saying, you know, we have people coming to us who actually need help. It's not only refugees who need assistance and who need information and who need, uh, you know, some orientation or language in order to um, do well. So, I mean, that was, that's definitely one of the pieces and that was a major change in how and who we serve and who we, you know, who we're responding to in the communities uh, across the country. Um, and I was going to just say a little bit about who's working in the sector now versus previously. Uh, when I started in my organization, um, and I did, I worked there on and off for a very long time, and I started as a settlement worker, I was hired as the only settlement worker under one uh, I had one manager over me, and I was responsible for the language programs. I, that was where my background was. It was uh, in uh, I'd trained to be a ESL teacher, as they were known. We were known at the time, and um, basically, I had that under me. Uh, I had uh, settlement under me, and I had childcare under me. 
So I had a lot of learning. So I think one of the things that characterizes most of the people you see here is we've all learned a lot of things that we didn't really anticipate learning in our careers, but also that's that's helped us understand the greater needs across across the program. So I'll just I'll leave it there. Yeah. So my story is similar to everybody's stories um, in how we started. Uh, one of the differences is that I was the executive director of a program in a rural setting. And so what I wanted to say about what's, how did we get from there to where we are now, I feel that there is more interest and increased recognition in, um, of immigration and settlement to small and rural communities, which is, um, which is great because in those small communities, a lot of the movement to the communities were employer-led, employer initiatives. And so many of our programs and services were in response to um, another driver of immigration. And then as well, um, local uh, um, refugee sponsorship groups were bringing newcomers to small communities as well. So I live in a small community of 5,000 people. And when the Syrian response happened, our local refugee sponsorship group bought five families. That was 45 people. And in a community of just under 5,000, that, that was a high percentage. Um, so settlement services, language training, child minding, all of those things responded. And we were, um, because of the profile of that situation, but also because of the employer initiatives, uh, the response in funding uh, was really great. It was able to, um, for us to expand programs and services. And currently, the, the, the town of Altona and the municipality of Rhineland in southern Manitoba have um, the privilege, privilege of having one of the RNIP programs. So that's the rural and northern immigration programs. And that has been quite successful, even in spite of COVID. Yeah, thank you. You're going to need your uh, headset because I'm going to be speaking in French. Euh, mon expérience à moi est un peu pareille à l'expérience de tout le monde, sauf qu'il y avait une particularité. Les immigrants francophones étaient une minorité dans une minorité. Donc, c'était des immigrants francophones dans une minorité de francophones vivant à l'extérieur du Québec au Canada. J'ai été... Euh, impliqué au début de la création de l'organisme que je dirige actuellement. Je terminais ma maîtrise à l'Université d'Ottawa. Et le focus n'était pas sur l'intégration. C'était juste un aspect économique que les immigrants francophones cherchaient à avoir un pouvoir économique. C'est pour ça que la compagnie que je dirige s'appelle Conseil économique et social d'Ottawa Carlton. Cependant, nous sommes un service d'établissement. Donc, vous voyez que le nom et ce que nous faisons aujourd'hui sont très différents. Je, après ma maîtrise, je suis parti travailler à l'international. Je suis revenu au Canada en 2004 et j'ai été vérifié est-ce que ce petit organisme existait encore parce que, avant de partir, je me disais qu'il n'avait aucun espoir. Il n'avait aucun support de la part des francophones et il n'avait pas très peu de support de la part des anglophones parce qu'ils venaient partager le nombre. À l'époque, c'était une question de nombre. Donc, le gouvernement payait et donnait des financements pour un certain nombre de personnes que vous allez servir. Donc, plus qu'il y a d'organismes à servir les gens, moins qu'il y avait de nombre pour les organismes individuellement. Ce qui est faux, et je vais vous dire pourquoi. Je suis revenu en 2004. Et j'ai eu l'occasion de travailler sur un petit projet, euh, de créer un guide, de se trouver un emploi au Canada. Parce qu'on avait réalisé que les gens qui viennent de l'extérieur, et particulièrement à cette époque, les francophones qui venaient, 
arrivaient de l'Afrique francophone ou de la Caraïbe. Donc, ce qui veut dire qu'il y avait beaucoup de barrières. La langue, ils ne parlaient pas anglais pour la plupart. La couleur, ils n'étaient pas de la bonne couleur. Et aussi, le fait qu'ils soient francophones dans une minorité francophone qui se bat pour se faire reconnaître. Donc, on se trouvait entre l'enclume et le marteau. Les francophones ne voulaient pas de nous parce qu'ils disaient qu'on était des traites, on allait travailler avec les anglophones, alors qu'eux, ils ne voulaient pas travailler avec nous, on n'avait pas le choix. Donc, finalement, je suis reparti en me disant qu'il n'y avait pas d'espoir pour les immigrants francophones. Cependant, en 2007, je travaillais aux États-Unis et euh, j'ai été appelé par l'organisme pour venir être le coordonnateur du réseau de soutien à l'immigration francophone, qui est une sorte de LIP francophone. Et quand je suis revenu, j'ai trouvé un terrain très, très difficile. J'ai décidé d'établir des bureaux dans des régions et quand j'ai dit à notre directrice de IRCC à l'époque, je vais ouvrir un bureau à Cornwall. Elle m'a regardé dans les yeux, elle m'a dit, « You mean Cornwall? <rire> » <rire> Donc, on est parti de très loin. Il fallait travailler avec les francophones pour qu'ils comprennent qu'on n'était pas là pour les remplacer, mais on était là pour les complémenter. Je me rappelle être parti dans une petite localité pour dire qu'on venait faire la promotion de l'immigration francophone. Et le maire de me dire, nous sommes 85% de francophones ici, pourquoi faire la promotion de l'immigration francophone Je lui dis, oui, vous êtes 85% de francophones qui vont mourir avant que moi je devienne senior. Donc vous avez besoin de renouvellement de la population. Vous avez besoin de gens qui viennent pour que vous puissiez continuer à être des francophones dans une localité francophone. Et je dois dire que euh, une des choses qui m'a qui beaucoup marqué, c'était le fait qu'à l'époque, on avait un projet de 300 000 dollars. 300 000 dollars canadiens. Quand j'étais basé au Congo, j'avais 200 000 dollars dans mon CEF au cas où on devrait quitter le pays. En urgence, il fallait payer pour quitter le pays. Donc, j'avais tous les jours 200 000 dollars dans mon CIF. Et quand je demandais à notre agente du ministère, quand est-ce qu'on va recevoir l'argent Elle a dit, non, c'est beaucoup d'argent, c'est vous n'allez pas recevoir. Je dis, what Qu'est-ce que j'ai fait Quelle bêtise que j'ai faite Je vais devoir retourner probablement à l'international. Mais comme ma femme et les enfants étaient ici, il y avait la pression de la famille pour pouvoir rester. Et je ne regrette pas d'être resté. Mais il faut dire une chose. La création des réseaux qui a été euh, le résultat d'un travail fait par des immigrants francophones et la FCFA a été un point de départ extrêmement important pour les francophones. Bien qu'après la création des réseaux, il y a eu la création des LIP. Et très souvent, on allait dans des réunions et on nous disait, il fallait faire comme les LIP. J'ai dit, mais non, c'est eux qui doivent faire comme nous. On a existé avant eux. Qu'est-ce que vous racontez? Mais ça a été le point de départ pour l'importance de l'immigration francophone. Et je dois dire aussi que l'immigration francophone a pris de l'importance. Et il y a même une division au niveau de IRCC actuellement qui nous accompagne, qui comprend le travail que nous avons besoin de faire et qui nous supporte. Et c'est une division qui est gérée par euh, Mme euh, Corinne Prince, que j'admire beaucoup, et toute son équipe. C'est des gens qui veulent vraiment travailler avec nous. L'autre chose qui me réconforte, c'est que dès mon arrivée dans l'immigration, je disais aux gens, il ne faut pas regarder à ce qui est bon pour l'organisme, mais pour l'immigrant lui-même. Donc, il faut qu'on puisse travailler anglophone, francophone, ministère, communauté, pour qu'on puisse vraiment faire de la place aux immigrants qui arrivent. Parce qu'il s'agit d'un projet de société que le Canada s'est donné. Et ce projet ne va pas réussir si tout le monde ne s'implique pas. 
Donc, pour moi, et c'est extrêmement important, on est rendu à un point où les francophones, on peut se battre l'estomac et dire, ben, on est, on est reconnu maintenant, on a notre place, mais on n'est pas, pas encore rendu là où on doit être. Parce qu'il y a une chose qu'il faut reconnaître. Il va falloir qu'à un certain moment, que les différents départements du ministère travaillent ensemble. Parce que des fois, nous disons une chose du côté gauche et le droit fait autre chose. Nous disons que nous voulons beaucoup d'étudiants francophones qui vont étudier pendant quatre ans, comprendre le système et pouvoir évoluer dans le système. Mais ceux qui doivent délivrer les visas ne les délivrent pas. Nous disons qu'il faut qu'ils viennent pour pouvoir rester. Ceux qui délivrent les visas leur refusent le visa, n'étant pas convaincus qu'ils vont retourner dans leur pays. Ce sont des dichotomies qui existent dans le système qu'il faudra qu'on arrive à harmoniser de façon à ce que l'on puisse effectivement favoriser l'immigration francophone. L'autre problème de l'immigration francophone, c'est que c'est des gens qui viennent de pays où les enfants ont une importance énorme. Donc ce sont des familles qui ont beaucoup d'enfants. On voit des familles qui arrivent du Congo, des familles de 11. Où est-ce qu'on va loger ces gens-là Donc il est extrêmement important aussi de pouvoir faire en sorte que l'on puisse créer l'environnement nécessaire pour que ces gens-là puissent se sentir chez eux et pouvoir vivre avec leur famille. Je pense que un autre segment de l'immigration, c'est le segment économique. Trop souvent, les employeurs au Canada croisent les bras et attendent que le gouvernement fasse ce qu'il y a à faire pour que les gens puissent intégrer le marché du travail. Les employeurs, eux aussi, doivent faire leur part. Quand j'étais aux États-Unis, beaucoup de compagnies s'occupaient de l'immigration, de l'intégration de leurs employés, de leurs familles, de leurs enfants. Ici, ce n'est pas la même chose. Les employeurs reposent trop sur le gouvernement. L'autre chose que j'ai envie de dire pour terminer, c'est que j'ai toujours dit que ça ne me plaît pas d'être devant vous. Je parle à des convertis. J'aimerais mieux parler à des gens qui sont soi-disant contre, parce qu'ils ne sont pas contre nécessairement. Ils ont peur. Donc, il faut les aider à surmonter leur peur. Ceux qui, dans la communauté, sont contre l'immigration, il faudra qu'on leur parle. Il faudra qu'on discute avec eux, qu'on puisse les amener à pouvoir comprendre l'importance de l'immigration et surtout de l'immigration francophone. Merci. OK, we're going to now turn to a couple of new questions. Um, Fairbours, what would you say constitutes a good settlement agency? Uh, I think a settlement agency, a good settlement agency is a good business. So we're all running a business. We produce product called settlement services. There's a language training, there's employment counseling, there's a, whatever we do is a product. So I think if you look at it from that lens, I think that would Obviously, everybody can come from the, in the room with some definition what is an entity that produces good product. As simple as that. So I think uh, if I want to categorize that, a good agency is a caring and uh, healthy environment. First, you have to have that because the people come to you. And I always say that to my colleagues, uh, that nobody gets up in the morning in Calgary and they have everything going for them and say, wow, well, what a good life, let's go to CCIS. It never happens. <laughs> Even when they get up in the morning and they feel that there is some problem with you know, this and that employment, they don't say that let's go to CCIS or the other agency. They call a friend, they just try to solve themselves. So usually they come to our doors when they are having a very bad day. And I think we have to really, really understand that. And that has to be embedded in the culture of organization that people are walking to our door. They have tried other means to solve the issues. And when they're coming to us and we are telling them that we are here to help you, we better do that. So I'm just going through the whole big picture. I don't want to go to the detail. I'm sure I'm working with, I'm talking to a group of experts here so I can learn from you. But this is the foundation of who we are. 
And then, I mean, I have actually in my organization, I mean, if you want a good practice and we're talking about using technology, I said I want iPad in each reception area. And I'm asking one question. How you feel when you are leaving us? I just wanted, I didn't care, I personally as a CEO, that if the program was outcome, output, I don't want to know that. I wanted to know how they felt. Did they feel better when they are leaving us than when they arrived? And this information comes to me. It's a very simple one question. And I think people come to us and we can't even solve their problem because some problems are complicated. But we owe them to make them feel better when, before they leave our office. That's how, how we treat this staff. I mean, I believe that every client's come in. I'll give you a, a quote I got from the Bishop Henry. I mean, we're not part of the diocese, but I listen to everybody. And that particular bishop, I have, I have a lot of respect for him. He, uh, we were talking about the vulnerable population because he was very grassroots, very, very advocate in our community. And one day he told me, uh, when you're dealing with the vulnerable people, it's so easy to get uh, them going and bring their uh, self-esteem up. Just See them as a king and queen. I know it sounds like a cliche, but it has, it has actually impacted me. So when they come in, in our organization, staff have to follow them to the elevator. That is a must. When they go in the room, the staff has to stand up. So I'm sure you guys practice that too. So going back to the question, a good settlement organization is a good, sound business model has to have it has to have a vision has to know why they, are, they exist look at this uh, a lot of things like onboarding our staff maintaining a culture and when it comes to program design and delivery we really have to understand the science this is a big complicated science behind settlement and integration and when you look at the countries like in some european and some area in canada when we see pocket of really issues is because we didn't follow the science. Simple as that. The science says, when you have a lot of refugees coming to your, your city, don't put them in one area. This is what the science says, is it proven. We know the examples. And if you're doing that, you're not doing a good job. We may help them to actually go to a place to stay, but overall immigration and integration, we're gonna pay a big price for that. So when I say about the science of it, we are dealing with hundreds or thousands of newcomers in our agency, very diverse in their skills, in their experience, in their expectation. So if you are designing, if you are putting, delivering a program that you're doing for past three years without changing it, oh, no good, it's not working. So it is like anything else. I mean, you look at this phone iPhone. I'm, I'm just going that far, actually. It's the same. To me, it's the same thing. Look at the, iPhone, the phone we used five years ago, ten years ago. If you had the same phone today, none of the application available, you could not access them. It's the same thing for what, what we do. So I really want to encourage you to think really in that level. Because every individual come to this country, like myself, like many of you in the room, we have a lot of hopes for our future. We spend a lot of invested. We took the danger to cross the borders to come to, this, to Canada. And we are very fortunate people, actually, by the way. Very fortunate to come to Canada. I always say that, and I really appreciate being in Canada, and I love it. So making them a citizen is a process. Making them to feel that this is their country is start with us. That's why I always say when we go talk about the refugee resettlement, because we do a lot of guards, we are not resettling them. We are creating a mindset. We are creating a way they would think about who they are in Canada and what Canada is all about. And we are failing to do that then it's not going to be a good agency. So agency that provides that, because it's not one model, it's, you know, the culture is different, the environment is different, the communities are different. But at the end of the day, if you're just resettling people, not really it's creating a mindset to say, I'm going to be Canadian, I'm going to be part of this country, and this is our job. Nobody else does that. The first impression, captive audience for a month or so, and they continue coming back. And I think this is what we need to do. So that, again, I said kind of an impact, then you can translate back to say, what agencies need to have to have 
to be that impactful, to create that impact in our climate. Thank you, Fairport. Uh, Lori? Everything that Fairboy said. <laughs> uh, I feel that a client center post uh, approach is a key element of a settlement agency, a good one, in being inclusive and welcoming, and we use that word often, but being respectful and so that the clients can see that that's, um, that is in that organization. And that comes down from the top, it comes down from the leadership of the organization. It's really important for the leadership to be passionate and have a heart for the work that's being done because that transfers to the staff who are the front line of um, the clients to see who, who they're talking with and how they're feeling respectful. I also feel very strongly that there has to be an opportunity for clients to feel safe in being able to provide feedback for what's working and what hasn't been working. Or if they've had connections with a staff person that hasn't been positive, it's really important because we want to ensure that the agency provides relevant and meaningful um, support for the newcomers. We also want to be able to have um, that information so we can address gaps in services so that we can have an opportunity to look at client needs versus what the organization can offer in future supports. There's opportunities out there for funding for various programs. We need to know whether we, um, what we need to do in order to access them, and the clients will tell us that. Uh, one of the things that I feel is really important as well as that a settlement service does more than deliver services. It also makes communi community connections. So client-centered and community-based. So that approach is where you're developing community partners and de uh, de building relationships, I would say, with community stakeholders, such as employers, um, educational institutions, healthcare, local government, economic and community development. It takes a whole team, really, to um, provide enough information to have informed and relevant services for the clients that you're serving. And also, I agree with Farrah Boys, um, the leadership. Uh, we, we had an elevator conversation yesterday. He was coming out of the elevator I was going in, and he told me he was retiring. And he said, but that just means that I'm not going to be the CEO anymore. It just means that I'm not going to have to change the toilet paper or the light bulbs. <laughs> so um, that's what he said. And it's so true. As a leader of a settlement organization, your staff needs to see you rolling up your sleeves and being engaged. You're not sitting in an office um, with the door closed. You're vacuuming, uh, you're greeting clients. If no one's at reception, you are doing your part because that helps for your corporate climate and it really makes everyone feel like they're a part of a team, which is extremely important. And finally, I wanted to say that my experience has been with small centers and so the one-stop shop model really works for small centers. We don't want to be the barrier for people to access services. So we can if house them in one space. It's easier for somebody who is new to access services. We don't have to send them away um, so that they have to go back again another day or something. Hey, we can walk you down the hall. and Oh, the settlement will, worker will walk you down the hall and we'll sign you up with the English uh, classes that you need. And from there on, if you need employment, we'll walk you down the hall and you can get that too. So I think that that model really works well. It doesn't work well in every place, but with my experience in smaller centers, it has been a very good model to use. Great, thank you. Um, we're gonna skip around a little bit. And uh, my next question for you, Deb, oh. is what are your hopes for the future of the settlement sector? What do you see as a goals for the sector moving forward? Um, <clears throat> so uh, I um, joined uh, Citizenship and Immigration back in 2008 as the Director General of the Integration Branch. 
And at that point in time, when I looked across the country from Bridget Foster in Newfoundland, Claudette and Jerry in Halifax, Craig Mackey, Lisa in, in New Brunswick, uh, Stéphane in Quebec, um, in Ontario, so many leaders, but Mario Kala and uh, Carl Nicholson. Um, when we got to Manitoba, people like Lori, um, Saskatchewan, Darcy and, and Gatachu. Marty Dolan. Yes, Marty Dolan. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, and Alberta, Fairbors, and many other wonderful leaders, and um, BC, Jean, and, and Chris Friesen. It was a time when there was a lot of strength in the sector. Um, that hadn't always been the case, but at, in those years, um, the government was investing more and more money, and um, things, things were changing. Um, but I think... Chris, are you going to be the last one of that whole group? Sure. I think so. Yeah, everybody, all, all your pals are going. So um, it's an exciting time. And the transition and the diversity in, in Ottawa here, um, because after I retired from citizenship and immigration, then I, I went back to work on Operation Syrian Refugees. And then I've been... Um, acting as vice chair for the Ottawa Local Immigration Partnership. So I've been able to see Carl Nicholson, Leslie Emery, Sharon Kahn um, retiring and see these wonderful new leaders, uh, Mary Roman, Miriam Mechney, Sharon, um, that are coming in. And that the diversity that they're bringing and that excitement and passion and um, determination is hugely important. Um, I'm always trying to separate out is the past and that experience, is it wisdom or is it baggage? Is it, is it tying us to the past or, or does it allow us to move, move, um, move into the future? The pieces that, that Jerry and, and Fairbors and, and the others have talked about always retain that passion and that purpose and that determination. Um, that's so important. Um, I think having confidence in the sector is hugely important. And I think that, like listening to the minister, he's obviously very committed to the future. And I think that that's a huge piece to build on. Um, I, I know Vicky's going to get out the, the, the stick soon. Um, like back like after the Second World War, settlement services were delivered by public servants. It was really only in the 70s that community organizations, and it really borrow, borrowed from the Secretary of State model, um, got involved and got funded, and it's been a long haul. But, you know, the, everybody was meeting in church basements and taking out personal loans and all that kind of thing. You're a real sector now, um, and you've got to get the compensation and the benefits that go with that so that you're not constantly losing people <laughs> to other places. Um, the, it, it, you're, you're huge. Um, David Cashback said that the settlement program's now over a billion dollars, I, I, which, I mean, it was the biggest discretionary part of the department when I was there, but it's, it's even bigger now. So. That's something to take seriously. And the fact that when I was in the department, I was always trying to fight to get people to pay attention to settlement and integration. There's now a dedicated ADM. There's uh, uh, new kinds of arrangements that the department's entering into in terms of partnerships and wanting to discuss um, dialogues. When, when I was working on these issues, a lot of other departments weren't paying attention. Now you have models where Industry Canada is partnering up with agencies on accepting new people. You, when we did Syria, the, the volunteer thing was crazy. You've got a whole system now for dealing with all of the volunteer donations so that we're not giving out those Johnson & Johnson bags. So, um, uh, and COVID, I mean, I could talk uh, a lot about COVID and what it's meant for here in Ottawa, but um, it has allowed you to use technology in a whole new way. And so thinking about that, like just seeing this pre-arrival thing, like that's so different than what I, what, what we were doing with pre-arrival. 
um, really harnessing that and working with IRCC on data and outcomes. Um, that is so important to tell the, tell the story of the impact that you're having. So that's my hope. Those are my hopes. Thank, Thank you. you. Jean, I'm going to turn to you now. Um, do you want to talk about your hopes or lessons learned? Your choice. Maybe I can blend them into both. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, I, I, listening to Deb and listening to the other speakers, I, I'm struck over and over again about from where we started and coming out of you know government delivering the services. Most of the progress that has been made to this enormous sector with you know, hiring many more people who are well prepared coming into the sector to actually do the work, that was certainly not the case when we started. We were all learning by the seat of our pants. Most of that work has happened because we have continued to talk to each other and work together. So that is part of my lessons learned. Anything that's happened has happened because we have worked together. Even though I, I looked a little bit at this, cheated and looked at the Slido questions, there's competition out there, we're competing with each other in certain cases, all of those things, but we still have to understand that it is always in the best interest of the newcomers coming to this country that we work exactly. together as best we can and that we're talking to each other and learning from each other. You know, I came you know, my work was done in Victoria. We're pretty isolated out there as, you know, as are our colleagues in Newfoundland at a time or, you know, other places around the country. And we're there with our heads down doing the work. And not, we weren't really understanding that other people were doing similar work. And it wasn't until we got together and really, in a concentrated way, focused way, talked to each other about what it was we were doing, what were the challenges that we could actually talk to CIC or IRCC about, you know, this is what seems to be working, and these are the places where we're all kind of finding uh, difficulty moving forward. So, you know, my big lesson learned is that working together works. It help us, helps us advance. We have to have patience, but that. And then I guess the other piece I really want to say, because of Deb just speaking, I want you to really think about, I often hear a refrain about, IRCC and they don't understand and you know basically there's a subtext that isn't very complimentary or respectful sometimes and it's been my experience that the people that work you know among our fund not just IRCC as a funder but other funders too they really care about this work and I think we're very fortunate in these this sector that IRCC seems to attract people who actually care and we can help them care by helping them meet the clients that they are serving by proxy through us. They used to meet them face to face and so it was a little more immediate for them. Now they don't, so we can help with that. But I think it's important to remember that the people who, you know, we're all working in the same industry and for the same goals and trying to figure it out. It doesn't always feel that way, but I think that's a sort of overriding thing we need to keep working with. So I'll stop there. Great. And Jerry, did you want to jump in? Um, my greatest hope is that uh, you continue to do the work that you've been doing. You're doing great work uh, and that you're supported to do it and that you don't burn out and that you look after each other and that you stand up. As we've all been talking, I think you can hear that refrain, you stand up. We've had a crisis of confidence, I think, in this sector. We're past that, past it. Stand up and say what you want and what needs to be done. Um, and that immigrants continue to play a significant role in the settlement sector. Um, they always have done. They bring, it brings an authenticity to the work that we do. Um, I think that's really important. I hope that the, um, the maturing credibility and the influence of, um, of the sector be used to work on systemic issues. It's already happening, but I'd like to see it so much more. Things like poverty and housing and food um, insecurity. Um, the environmental issues, uh, discrimination. I think we've, um, we are leaders in many of these issues, but we need to stand up. Um, I think we sometimes undervalue our knowledge and experience. Um, that you capitalize on the new technologies. I know it's happened over uh, the last few years because of the pandemic, um, but it's only, as uh, Faribault has talked about his phone, it's only gonna change in the next five minutes again. 
Um, uh, the funding arrangements, going back to CIC, I absolutely agree with what uh, Jean was saying around the relationships with um, especially, um, especially IRCC. Um, that reporting the proposal developments um, be simpler, more streamlined, not just for the sector, but for the government. Government doesn't need that either. Uh, we're all in it for the same reason. We want it to work. Um, so uh, I think uh, I'd like to see that uh, changed. Um, I hope would be that um, what we get out what's critical. It doesn't mean that IRCC or the funder doesn't get what they want out of uh, out of the processes, but that um, it's it's just easier for all of us. And we've been talking about this for the last 30, 40, 50 years. Uh, and there comes a time when I think we just stand up and say, and both organizations, both the funders and um, the sector stand up and say, okay, this is enough. There has to be a better way. Um, although five years funding is pretty good, believe me, when you had six months, three months funding. Um, I hope um, there has to be, there has to be more appropriate compensation uh, benefits, work-life balance. Uh, a broader recognition of your professionalism and your contribution to the community and to nation building. I don't think anybody outside this room recognizes that what you do um, day in, day out um, is nation building and is bettering communities. Um, most of us, uh, if not all of us, fell into this. Uh, we did not wake up in the morning and say, this is the sector I want to work on. Um, we developed this sector um, and we're handing it over to you now um, to, to move it forward. But it needs, uh, you know, people, people are moving now to Nova Scotia from se the sector in different parts of the country to work um, in the sector. And that never happened a few years ago. There weren't people who had the experience anyway. But now people are applying for jobs. So it's a sector, it's a national sector, um, and we can be proud of that. But it needs compensation, it needs education training, and it needs uh, funding security um, to be able to make that happen. Um, and finally, I hope that the sector itself thrives, that the networks that have been built flourish, that umbrella associations that have played such a significant role in bringing us um, together, in getting us recognized, in allowing us to talk to each other, I hope their contribution is supported. There have been many retirements, both in uh, the sector and in government over the last number of years, but we can't rely on individuals. We need to rely on systems um, to carry this forward. It's been built on individuals, on the leaders, both in the sector and in the government. We've left. <laughs> um, it needs to be um, to move forward in systems so that when individuals leave, it doesn't fall apart. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. I think I just going to mention a few key messages. I don't go into it, but I really hope that you take it back and reflect on that. One is the immigration to Canada is not a program, it's an industry. If you look at the definition of industry, it actually meets all the definition of industry. It's a huge, we're dealing with 700, 800,000 people, billions of dollars. When you look at it, billions of dollars are being imported to Canada. So it is really an industry. The last, the other thing I want to say is what makes you unique in your community? You are the expert not only for IRCC. You have the knowledge. You, that's why you need to help your health system. They should rely on you, your health system, your school system, your landlords, your community association. And if you create that in your group, in your agency, then you really become an, an entity that they cannot live without you. And I'm sure you are already experiencing that. People are calling us from all walk of life, all the different level of community. They want our expertise. Don't lose that. Hire some thinkers in your organization. I think I was talking to somebody in IRCC, a great guy. I said, what do you do? He said, he thinks. <laughs> That's what he told me. I mean, it was nice. I mean, he thinks. 
So I said, the good thing that IRCs can hire somebody who can only think. We can't. <laughs> but I think by chance we've hired thinkers, but try to hire thinkers. Because it's so important that somebody start thinking while everybody's crazy running around. So that's another key message I wanted today. Celebrate each other's successes. You know, we all have a history. The problem is we still refer to agencies as small and large. All these large agencies are not letting us to do what we do. We have to get out of that. Agency started, I mean, I told you my, my original my organization, again, I'm not bragging, I'm just stating the fact. If we own all our building, if we have 450 staff, if we are 14, 16 location, it's not by accident. It goes with number of other agencies that I can see here. It was a hard work. 34 years of my life and many, many people that actually were part of the group that we made it happen. So let's celebrate each other's achievement. That is pity competition sometime in the communities is really, is really disappointing. At the end of the day, people see us as a group, as an expert. Find a way to work with each other. So again, I'm just hopefully think about it, take it back and look at it, celebrate each other's achievement. In business, it's simple. You kill the competition, you walk away, you go. Here, we don't do that. We try to work with each other. But you can work with each other if the good work is not recognized and celebrated. And as a big organization, ongoing, you have to apologize for being good. No, honestly, I'm just being very blunt, and I want you to take that back. If either you come from a small organization or, or large organization, I did not come as a, I was a, just kind of, I was, I was technocrat and entrepreneur coming to this sector. Many of my clients, again, I'm only one element of this whole team. But I, I tell you this, constantly we have to apologize. Sorry. No, we don't. Go back and think, if you are an organization for 30 years and you don't own your building, you have a problem. Still, you are paying big bucks as a rent. IRCC, thank to her, she changed the policy so we can get fair market value if we own the property, and that is debt. Deborah did that price. So go back, talk. Why not? I mean, we. I mean, and again, I'm again. Believe me, it's not <laughs> bragging. I'm just telling you the benefit of it. Eleven years ago, we were paying a million dollars rent. Now we, I'm not I. Agency collects a million dollar rent. Out of that is two million, two hundred thousand dollar profit. So I don't have to wait for seven years to buy a computer. I can buy a computer as soon as we we need a computer. <laughs> Build capacity. Build wealth for organization. An organization doesn't have an asset after 30 years, they should close the door. I'm being blunt, but I really want to give you a key message. Is go, uh, go back if you're a senior staff or even junior, doesn't matter. Bring it up. You need to have something to show after 30 years, 40 years. So if the funding gets cut off, you don't just suddenly say, what, my God, what are you going to do? Because you have a mandate from your community. You're not there just because there's money. If you do a good job, then funders are going to come to you. Because they are looking. One thing is always constant. Funders want return for the investment. They politic. They are nice to all of us. They try to, you know, you know, I understand that. But at the end of the day, if we do a good job, we make them look good. <laughs> so just focus on the product and build capacity. Thank you. I really have to say that. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I think instead of our questions, we'll now open it up for your questions. So can we have Slido up on the screen, please? So the first question is, now that there's more organizations and communities, do you suggest to foster collaboration rather than competition? And how do we avoid duplication of services? Who would like to take this question? I'll jump in. <laughs> Um, it is, it, it, you know, I'm not sure that uh, having more agencies has made it worse in terms of competition. I think that that competition has always been there. I know that as nonprofits, we kind of absorb the message that we're not supposed to be competing, but we are. It's reality. Um, that said, I think we can find ways to collaborate. Um, I, there was mention of the umbrella organizations. I think that's a very uh, important space in which to look at what different groups are doing. 
Um, you know, part of not recreating something that already exists is knowing that it exists. And I find very often you'll hear people say, oh, you know, there's no program that does X. When we're saying, wait a minute, we do X. <laughs> they just don't realize that we do X. So, I mean, I think part of that is just communicating about what you do and, and finding the spaces to share that so that, you know, so that you, they can be built upon instead of uh, replicated or I mean, sometimes it's necessary to have two programs doing the same thing or three programs doing the same thing. But it's not necessary, you know, that, it, um, that one supplants the other. So I think, I think those things are important. I think it's um, very important as we think as agencies. I mean, you know, Faribors has talked about the development of agencies and where they are. I think, you know, part of that is also learning to work with your competitors in a way that's open and frank and, you know, understands that we can, that we don't have to be jealous of each other. Some, sometimes it feels, you know, very emotional, in part because many of the people that have started these agencies through the years, this has been their whole life. You know, you can't do something for 32 years for a particular organization and not be very loyal to that organization. So it's, you know, it's finding the ways to, to break through that and have those conversations. And maybe this is a wonderful opportunity mm -hmm. as some of us who've been here very long term and are very invested in that kind of way to the particular agency to open up those conversations. Anybody who comes into the role of CEO or executive director is charged with keeping that organization healthy in many ways, that's their job. So you can't expect them not to be, you know, understanding their, the landscape that way, but that said, there are many opportunities to look at how we build things together. And I think about some things like some of the new programs that have come in over the years that didn't exist. And maybe I'll use the example of Swiss. You know, the, the Settlement Workers in Schools program has been, you know, it was developed in Ontario and we have been rolling it out across the country and trying it and it's been growing. And really, it doesn't hurt to have a Swiss program in every school district across the country, in every school across the country, that would surely be a helpful thing. The only place where the competition comes in is resources, right? So that's the kind of uh, conversation that we have to have, and it doesn't really help to take uh, you know, resources away from places in uh, very dense, with very, you know, a lot of immigrant population and dense populations in school districts and put it in, uh, you know, ones where there's very little, but it's still important to have it where there's very little. So it's really trying to look through as we think about the landscape, you know, how we can do things differently. It's not, everything isn't going to look the same, you know. So in, uh, I'll give an example of Nanaimo for, you know, in BC. This is a smaller city, but, the, you know, it's very challenging for the youth in the school system in Nanaimo because they're a very small minority, those immigrant youth. It's a different situation than it would be for a youth in a school in you know, downtown Toronto or downtown Vancouver. And the programs don't have to look exactly the same. So it's trying to think through those things. And I think that through collaboration, we can do those kinds of things and make organizations healthy, keep organizations healthy. So. Thank you, Jane. I'm gonna go on to the next question. Um, with the retirements of so many experienced leaders in our sector, what mechanisms would you suggest to retain your knowledge and connections in our sector? Very good question. Fair Boris? I think, uh, first of all, we have to build ongoing. I mean, it's not that we know it all. I mean, we are learning every day. As I said, it's so different, so uh, changing the environment we live. So we have the knowledge, actually, but we have to empower them. There are groups that they, in your organization, there are experts that they need to do that. So there are some conversation, actually, like this session, for instance, today, this is an uh, effort. So we are talking about having some conversation because we are dedicated. We want really to support not only the agency we work, because now, we will be free. And even the, our succession planning is changing because I'm stepping down as, a sept as December 31st as a CEO, but I'm not leaving the organization. I'm going to be working there for some time. So we are trying different models to keep that. But one thing I think uh, as, uh, with the succession planning, I think one of the things we are very, not very good, I won't give a good mark with the, with the sector to the succession planning. 
When I, I mean, with all respect, I mean, I do hope I'm not getting a wrong message. But when I see an agency with 600 people and they have no two or three people that they can take top job, as a business person, I said there must be something wrong. McDonald never hires the top people from outside, never. And one of the most successful business in the world. And it goes to the you know, big, big company like uh, Microsoft and others. So I think we need to pay more attention to our six, not only on CEO, CEO level, on all the levels. I think that way, then you actually prepare people, you give them an ambition to learn and uh, become. So that is one way of succession planning is another a good way of in the future. So if I know I'm gonna take a job in two years, so I'm gonna build that capacity. And also talking to each other, session like this, maybe, I mean, actually we are thinking about doing some webinar time to time, just share some ideas. But not that we know everything and is not really, because my colleagues that they are hired, you know, last, they're far more capable of handling current situation than I am. However, as I said, we build that culture. And this is what I think we could contribute. Thank you. Thank you, Fairboris. Uh, this is a tough question. Um, uh, we'll see who wants to answer that. Okay, uh, given your frontline experience, how do you feel about ramping up of immigration levels and are the proper infrastructures in place? Any advice for IRCC? Je veux répondre à cette question spécifiquement parce que je pense que pour les francophones, c'est un défi. Et euh, autant que je suis très heureux de savoir que le ministère, le ministre lui-même l'a dit, que l'immigration francophone est importante, autant que je suis inquiet parce que si on veut amener des immigrants francophones dans des petites régions où il y a des petites organisations francophones qui les desservent, il va falloir donner à ces organisations-là la, la possibilité de développer leurs capacités. Et un des problèmes que les organisations francophones confrontent et ont confronté par le passé, c'est que on leur demande de délivrer des services sans avoir une administration. Et ça, c'est un problème qui doit être adressé. Parce que si vous voulez qu'une petite organisation soit en mesure de délivrer des services, il faut l'aider à s'organiser, à avoir la capacité administrative nécessaire pour pouvoir gérer le service qui sera donné par les, les, les employés. Et il faudra, comme tout le monde a dit, donner des, des, des salaires qui sont acceptables pour qu'on puisse attirer les bonnes personnes dans nos organismes. Je pense que c'est extrêmement important. C'est une... Le, on pas, le Canada n'a pas de choix que d'augmenter le nombre d'immigrants qui arrivent parce qu'on aura besoin de ces immigrants-là pour garder l'économie canadienne assez forte dans l'économie mondiale. Mais il faut se donner les moyens de pouvoir utiliser ces immigrants qui arrivent parce qu'il y a un autre problème auquel on fait face, c'est qu'on fait venir des gens qui sont très préparés, qui ont coûté très cher, mais ils n'arrivent pas à servir comme ils l'auraient souhaité. Donc c'est extrêmement important. Et aussi, amener des gens dans des petites localités, il faudra faire attention à tout ce qui est l'aspect culturel. Donc, quand on amène des gens dans des, dans des, dans des communautés, il faudrait qu'il y ait un travail qui se fait, et en amont et à l'aval. Et les immigrants les préparer à aller dans ces communautés-là, et les communautés à les, pré, les préparer à recevoir des gens qui sont différents, qui s'habillent différemment, qui parlent différemment qui ont un accent. Donc, c'est extrêmement important pour moi de pouvoir bâtir cette capacité dans les petites euh, régions. Thank you. So, somebody different. Um, if you could redo one thing during your time working in the sector or with the sector, what would it be? Jerry. Um, I would have looked up earlier um, and start uh, just working on what was in front of me. Um, going back to that first question that um, Jean was talking about, it's that partnership piece. Um, people were doing the same work as we were uh, in our community, let alone across the country. And once we actually knew that people were having the same problems, they, they had some of the answers that we were looking for. We had some of the answers that they were looking for. They had great programs that we could um, uh, we could request funding for to be able to respond to some of the needs. Um, 
I, we were so um, heads down. Um, we needed to be, I get that, um, but should have looked up earlier, should have looked up much earlier. Thank you. Make a comment on that collaboration. I think we say uh, partnership collaboration, obviously we all do that. I mean, you can't really function as a settlement if you don't have it. But I think part of that is a government problem to start with. Because they talk about collaboration without really defining what it means. What is the purpose of it? So, and I actually, I have now trained like this. People, they talk more about collaboration than the one that are doing least of the collaboration. <laughs> no, honestly, I, I would say that. I mean, because, because if, you, if you are a successful organization, if you're doing a program, if your clients are coming and you are meeting the objective of your program, so obviously you are doing it in partnership. So competition, again, don't get me wrong, competition is good for consumer. This is the fact, and I said that. We are a business. We are developing pro pro program, and clients should have the right to choose where they go. And they usually go, they're smart. They're smart people. They're like us. I mean, I was a client 34 years ago. So I went where I got something out of my, my time to go there. So within the context of competition, when there's an RFP coming from anybody, yes, we compete, and we should compete. We should do our best to put the best program, best uh, uh, system to measure the outcome, all that. But once that is done, which is again, this is going for five years now with IRCC, with others for three years, so the competition could stop. Then it become collaboration. However, people have to accept that this agency is doing this. Let me support that. If they, for the next five years they're not going to accept that in a way to support that funding that was gained through a competition, a fair, a fair competition, then that is the problem. So we really need to talk about what collaboration means. Because again, people think that collaboration is only within the sector. No. You should spend 80% of your time collaborating with people who are not in the sector. The businesses, the landlords, the industry, the pre-apprenticeship people, the uh, school board, and 20%. But people feel that if you're doing that, they think, oh, you're not collaborating. Then let's talk about what it means, what are the criteria of measuring an agency that does collaborate, and who we should collaborate with. I think that is lacking. That's why we always talk about, are we collaborating? Because we don't know what are we doing and how we measure that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm not sure this is a question exactly. Retention of staff is still a concern. I hope that we would also look at the salaries of staff, especially in small centers. So this is the whole issue of retention. Um, but I don't know, the question it seems there's an obvious answer, which is yes. <laughs> um, does anybody want to address this question or should we? Maybe I, could, maybe I could just quickly say something. This is an observation from what's happened in British Columbia over the years. Um, the funding for smaller centers has been quite limited. And so I think every time, I don't think it's quite as true in the larger centers. For the smaller centers, it's a real concern, is the funding has, is a small amount, and then, but the need is increasing. And so anybody in a leadership role, the, you know, the, your ED, your boards, are always looking at that question of, you know, how can we meet the need and that usually means having enough staff <laughs> to meet the need. And then they have the same pot of money to deal with. So it's, or a very you know, limited amount. So I think part of this goes to the funder around realistically funding supports in smaller communities so that there can be you know, an appropriate you know, compensation for the people working there and appropriate workloads. But we haven't, you know, this is a, an area for collaboration that is greatly needed. And we've done some beginnings into this, but it certainly needs to be taken up, is how does this look equitably across the sector, big center, small center, big agency, small agency, because it's, you know, it's true. A lot of places, especially in smaller communities and smaller agencies are not getting paid as well as they're, you know, colleagues who are overworking in a bigger agency doing very similar work. So I think it's something that it doesn't, I don't think it will get resolved without a good deal of collaborative discussion and comparisons and openness about this is what we're paying, this is what we're paying, 
why the difference, why is it there. I think when presented well and clearly and fully, I think people realize there's a need to, to do something about it. Thank you. Deborah, I'm going to um, give you this question. Uh, what changes do you anticipate, <clears throat> expect, or wish to see in the sector in the next decade or so? Not a small question. No, I know. <laughs> um, well, I, uh, uh, you know, you, you have this question about uh, the whiteness of the majority of the senior leaders. I, I think you're going to see a lot more diversity. And I think that that's a powerful thing for the sector. And I think that that is going to advance inclusion. I, I find the, the comments Fairbors was making about how important it is to work at the community level with the police, with, I, I mean, like, during COVID, like we really tackled bylaw enforcement because it was so focused on racialized immigrant communities to, you know, that were being kicked out of parks and things like that. Um, and once you start talking to people, then you can make some changes. All the work that Hindia did with the healthcare sector about vaccination rates and all of that. I do think that that's going to be an important thing for the sector in the coming decade is expanding that circle. And um, I, I love all the things that people have talked about in terms of how, how you um, work together. And I, when I went back and did the Syrian thing, and I was petrified because the government had such an ambitious expedited target, and I really didn't think that we could do it. And I remember doing a first phone call, and Fairbour said, we've got this. We can do this. We've done it before. We did Operation Parasol. We did this. We did that. I like, um, you guys really pull things together, and you'll continue to do that. Thank you. Yep. So I want to thank all of these pa panelists. Um, for sharing their experience and their knowledge, and we do hope these conversations will continue. It's super important. Um, but before we end this session, I would like to call up Bernadette Reynolds uh, to pay tribute to one of our senior leaders um, who passed away recently, uh, Craig Mackey. Thank you, Vicki. Craig would really like to have been here today. I'm told by many that this was his favorite conference. I was also told by Craig recently that to stay in touch with Vicki and Jean would be a very good thing for a new executive director. Craig Mackey served as our executive director for URSA the Immigrant and Refugee Services Association, formerly the PEI Association for Newcomers, from early 2010 until late 2021. Craig was an unwavering champion for newcomers to the province and made constant efforts to personally meet as many clients as possible and learn as many different greetings and salutations as he could. Three weeks into the job, I thought Craig spoke about 12 languages because every time I saw him meeting someone at the door, he had, I felt, a conversation. He was really just saying hello in their language. He was tireless in promoting the integration aspect of the association's mission. And the well-being of the newcomer community was a driving principle in the work with URSA. Before joining URSA, Craig spent much of his professional career in broadcasting, primarily with the CBC. As a, as a reporter and managing editor, Craig lived and worked in communities throughout the country. As a staunch supporter of indigenization, he was especially proud of the time he was afforded to spend in Canada's north, where he experienced firsthand what, communications, what, what communities can achieve when they come together. Craig's passions in life included his family, nature, tai chi, reading, and curling. He was introduced to the sport as a child and spent 
parts of the next six decades competing locally, regionally, and nationally. I am glad that we're able to honor Craig in his final weeks by renaming the URSA scholarship in his name, the Craig Mackey Memorial Scholarship. Going forward, we will continue to honor Craig by serving our communities like Craig always did. This has been a very difficult time for URSA staff and our board. We will miss Craig's generosity, curious nature, and quick wit. Very quick wit, if you remember. But it is comforting to know, although it's a sad time, that we live in a country where Craig was able to have some control over how his life would end. He picked his own time using medically assistance in dying program. In his final Facebook post, Craig wrote, death is a natural end to life. Ending suffering is a compassionate end of life choice. An, ad an advocate to the very end. Adios, mi amigo. Godspeed.